So, okay, so we were talking about the international law of the sea. Uh, we said that it, it comprises of customs, treaties, and certain regulations that pertain to the seas. And we have spoken uh, in my earlier class, I mean, uh, sometime back, we've spoken in terms of the high seas and so on. So let me go through the slides directly. So save our time. Okay, so um, in today's class, we have been talking about the history and development, and this is just a reiteration of the entire stuff that we discussed today. So uh, chapter one, the history of the development of law. So what means by the law of the sea? As we all know that the world depends on free trade, commerce, and effective communication. When we are talking about the law of the sea, we are basically talking in terms of two P's. P for prevention, P for protection on one hand. On the other hand, we are talking about, um, you know, exploitation of resources or the use of resources. One hand, you use the resources. On the other hand, you strive to protect and preserve those resources, right? So, you know, the world has progressed over the years. There has been free trade, technological developments. There has been, uh, you know, um, utilization of resources, exploitation of resources. If there is exploitation and usage of resources of the sea, so obviously there is a need to, you know, protect those resources. And while you're doing that, uh, while you're using the resources, there's also pollution. So when there is pollution of resources, you try to protect those resources. You try to prevent pollution. So this is all we are talking, uh, I mean, this is all that uh, we are going to talk about in the subject in the law of the sea how, and what comprises of you know uh, of uh, what comprises uh, or what basically is involved in the subject of law of the sea so we are going to talk in terms of territorial waters we are going to talk in terms of internal waters we are going to talk about high sea and the contiguous zones in the subsequent slides i've just given the definition and as i've even taught you earlier this is a reiteration well, so one of the modes of trade, transportation, and communication is, of course, by the sea. Countries, they, uh, you know, earlier, they engaged in disputes over the international water zones, claiming fishing zones. And in the early 1400s, just for your information, Spain and Portugal, they were all big names. They were maritime powers. So they used to claim, you know, a certain area of international water zones and uh, for for the purpose of fishing. So there were a lot of uh, disputes and the uh, countries were at loggerheads. For instance, an additional 12 miles of water was claimed by Russia in the early 1900s as their fishing zone. So the principle here is in the law of the sea is that the state that owns the surrounding land desires to extend its right even to adjacent and surrounding waters. So, for example, if this is a land, if this is a particular state, okay? So, what they are saying, this land belongs to a particular state. So, that means even the area that has surrounding waters, I would claim even the surrounding waters. But the law of the sea fixes the extent to which I can have power or I can extend the jurisdiction or my sovereignty over the additional waters which are there in this area, right? I ho hope I'm trying to make it clear to you. Well, so therefore, early in the 17th century, what happened, going back to the early history, Portugal claimed again, this is an instance, one of the examples, Portugal claimed huge tracts of high seas as part of the territorial domain. You see, I've already explained to you what is high, high seas just some time back. So what it did was, you know, what are the high seas? Now, this is, for example, one country, say, example, okay. Say this is country A or country X. This is country X. Now, from here, for, uh, you know, for 12 nautical miles, it is the territorial seas, okay? So here, the country exercises, again, certain sovereign powers. Now, from there onwards, to a certain extent, we have the contiguous zones. 
So again, from the edge of the territorial seas to further, it's considered as a high seas, okay? Now what happened? Portugal claimed huge tracts of, not this portion, not this portion, but beyond that, the high seas, okay, which is part, uh, 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 which was not part of its territorial domain, but it said that it should come, uh, it tried to claim that as part of its territorial domain. So this claim was actually criticized by a Dutch statesman and a scholar called Hugo Grotius. Thereby, there was a need later on with this kind of a disputes and controversies that were taking place. There was a need felt to address the squabbles between, uh, between the part between the countries, and uh, these squabbles were snowballed into disputes. And kind of they weren't loggerheads, and then it became huge disputes. So much so, like there were huge controversies, and thus to address such kind of controversies, the law of the sea developed over the years. So, what is the intention or the purpose of the law of the sea? The purpose of the law of the sea is to bring about, a, you know, order and you know to have a peaceful environment that everybody enjoys the natural resource of the sea, right? Okay. So, Hugo Gracious was considered as the father of international law. Hugo Gracious, in his treatise, Mary Liberum, in 1609, he made a mention of the need of regulating the sea by systemic law, and he opined that the law of the sea is a body of international law governing the right and duties of the state in maritime environments. Here, I'd like to make a mention of a particular uh, you know, a particular concept that he was talking about also is about the freedom of navigation. Now, this concept, freedom of navigation, is used even till today after so many years, so many thousands, uh, so many hundreds of years, rather. So, you see, so he came up with the principle of freedom of navigation. He came up with the principle of freedom of seas. He says he was actually a, you know, a natural law theorist. OK, so he expounded the doctrine of the open seas and he opined that the oceans are rest communists and thus cannot be commonly appropriated and be accessible to all nations. So his work sparked criticism as well. Nevertheless, it did result in the development of the law of the seas. So law of the sea, therefore, is that branch of law again that, you know, reiterating that deals with the regulation of international waters, territorial waters and maintaining public order regulated by international covenants and treaties. So it governs the maritime commerce. So it is a branch of codified international law today, codifying the law regarding territorial waters, sea, lanes, and resources. Merriam-Webster's Law Dictionary defines the law of the sea as a body of international law promulgated by United Nations Convention and covered covering a range of ocean matters, including territorial zones, access to and transit on the sea, environmental preservation, and the resolution of international disputes. Now, uh, this has been a, a primary convention, an intermediate convention in those days, the 1958 the Law of the Sea Convention. It was also called internationally as an interim convention, which was actually, uh, you know, a, a kind of a foundational convention those days in 1958, which served as a precursor or which triggered the development of codified law in this area. But I would also say, I would not shun in saying that Hugo Grotius' treatise of uh, Marie Liberum in uh, 1609 actually triggered off the development of the law of the sea. But in modern era, you know, approximately, you know, you know, modern era, you could say that the law of the sea convention of 1958, that actually led to the precursor of development of codified law in this area. So law of the sea convention encompasses within its ambit three other conventions, convention on the territorial sea and contiguous zones, Convention on the High Seas, Convention on Fishing and Conservation of Resources of the High Seas. So in this subject, though this is just an introductory class, in the further classes that we are going to have, there's going to be seven hours more classes, there are seven classes altogether. So in those seven classes, we are going to delve deeply into the subject. To set the perspective, this introductory class, I'd like you to know what is territorial sea, what is a high sea, and what are contiguous zones. Apart from that, I'm going to just throw light also on the internal waters. 
internal waters is distinct from territorial sea or high sea. Territorial sea is an area that is surrounding a particular land or a particular country. High sea is beyond the territorial sea. Contiguous zones or those zones which are attached to the territorial sea, a certain nautical, a certain uh, you know nautical miles distance from the territorial sea. Now, internal waters are internal waters which come within the jurisdiction and the sovereign powers of a particular state, country, or a particular nation. For example, the example of uh, internal water is rivers, bays, lakes, and so on. Right. So what is territorial sea? Okay, before we go to territorial sea, I'm just going to point out in this class about United Nations Covenant Convention on the Law of the Sea, UNCLOS. You went close, so you abbreviated UNCLOS. Now, this is actually considered as a charter or the constitution of the law of the sea or the laws that pertain to the sea. So this is a constitution. Uh, it operates as a grant norm. It operates as a constitution of the law of the sea. So United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea was signed on December 10, 1982, and it came into force in 1994 with the requisite number of 60 nations, that is minimum, but they crossed the minimum number and they had 117 countries for a start acceding to the terms, that is, they agreed to the terms, and they ratified the treaty, that is, they gave their consensus. So what is this convention? This operates on the principle of consensus. That is the state parties who concede, or oh, sorry, who, who accede, who accept, who ratify, who sign the treaties, who are the signatories to the treaties, they are, with this particular treaty, they are bound by the treaty. So later, more than 150 countries were made a party to this treaty for ratification. So therefore, it is worthwhile, here just a, just a kind of... Um, a passing remark that I would make uh, saying that, you know, USA was not interested to be a part of this uh, convention. However, it is a party to the 1956 convention and it follows other international customary provisions that may be reflective of the 1982 convention. Now, before we delve into uh, this further, let us first understand what means territorial sea. Territorial seas are distinct from the high sea. So the treaty UNCLOS, that is United Nations Convention on the Law of the uh, Sea, defines territorial waters as those, see, imagine this is a state party, those waters that are extending 12 nautical miles, 22 kilometers beyond a country's coast from the baseline watermark and gives a country exclusive fishing and mining rights in waters extending to 200 nautical miles, 370 kilometers from its coast. Now, territorial seas are thus waters that are immediately adjacent to the country's state territory or shores of the state and are subject to the authority and governance of that state. Now, trespassing over those waters, that is, you cross those waters, crossing or just passing through those waters, trespassing. Why we are saying trespassing, that is, you just go without permission. Trespassing over these waters is not permitted, really. But other state parties, by the other state parties, uh, however, you know, uh, it can be done, uh, you know, under the principle of innocent passage, which means an authorized passage over the waters in compliance with international law and with all the protocols that are really followed. Now, what means contiguous zones? Contiguous zones are zones where there are additional water stretches. You know, there can be additional water stretches, like, for example, straits, canals, which just pass by. So those, uh, what about those zones? So those zones, they have defined it as the waters that are beyond the limit or outer edge of a territorial sea, 24 nautical miles, 44 kilometers approx from the baseline within which the state exercises control and inflicts punishment for the infringement of its territorial limits. Or, you know, then it appropriates the relevant laws and regulations in that area in case of infringement. So the state can exercise its power over these contiguous zones in order to prevent or punish trespass over its waters and infringement of relevant provisions of the law and regulation, granting it right over the waters. So these are kind of special, uh, these are kind of zones uh, where, you know, the state parties are granted special limited jurisdiction. 
Now, what are high seas before I talk about the internal waters? Waters beyond the territorial seas or international waters or the high sea or which every nation or state can freely use. However, illegal activities and criminal activities are forbidden and would constitute an international offense. Examples, piracy, slave trade, and so on. So therefore, every nation or state has got a right to sail its vessel you know, flying its flag over the high seas. So I said, what are the high seas? It is beyond this. This limit is the territorial waters. So beyond the territorial waters is the high sea. So high sea is defined by Merriam-Webster's dictionary as the open ocean, especially that, uh, you know, is not within a country's jurisdiction. And they also call as, they're classified as A, B, and J, that is areas beyond national jurisdiction, uh, or the water stretches that are beyond national jurisdiction can come uh, within the ambit of the definition of high sea or can be called as high sea. Next is what are internal waters? Internal waters, again, reiterating, you know, uh, there are waters which are, uh, you know, come within the area of a particular state where the state has got complete sovereignty over those waters um, within which that means the area within which the state exercises complete sovereignty over the waters. Example, bays, lakes, rivers and so on. Now, what is the difference between internal waters and, you know, uh, territorial waters? In internal waters like rivers, no other country can simply barge, you know, bring their vessel into the internal waters without permission. That means they have no right of innocent passage. Foreign vessels cannot or are not permitted to enter internal waters like rivers, bays, lakes of some other country. However, in rarest of rare circumstances, if they seek to enter, they follow a particular protocol and they are made subject then to the domestic legislation of the coastal states in case of any infringement. For example, if there is a, a kind of a negligent act that is done or negligently they have come within the waters or with the negligently they have just come into the rivers of some other country. So then what happens? The port authorities will take certain action against them for negligent entry. And in case they find something foul or some foul game happening, they can even incarcerate the vessel within their port. Are you understanding me? Next is, what about criminal action in internal waters? Sometimes, you know, criminal action may also be taken, but they're not always common. However, uh, in case there is disruption of peace and order or there is something that is a certain criminal activity that has taken place, of course, criminal action has to be taken and will be taken by a particular state or by a particular country within which the internal waters flow. Example, again, rivers, lakes and so on. There has been a famous case of Wildenhu, W-I-L-D-E-N-H-U, Wildenhu's case, just for you to understand what our internal water is. In this case, the U.S. court held that, United States court held that, the U U.S. courts do have jurisdiction to handle a Belgium case of murder, where a Belgium national was murdered in Belgium vessel while in the internal waters of the U.S., so this gave rise to what concurrent jurisdiction to handle the case. Now imagine, remember that this is a U.S. Uh, you know uh, the the waters are uh, you know within the territory of USA. Now there has been a Belgium uh, vessel or a Belgium ship that came within the internal waters of United States of America and there there was a murder that took place that is a criminal offense by whom by a Belgium national of whom of a Belgium national there in U.S. waters on what on a Belgium ship so in such kind of a condition who is going to handle the case so the United States court said that, well, I can handle the case. We can handle the case. Why? Because though it is a Belgium vessel, though the party, uh, though the person, the one who, the, the, the offender or the, the perpetrator of the crime is a Belgium national and the victim is a Belgium national, but yet it has been committed inside my territory. It is, the offense is committed within United States. Right. So that means I have concurrent jurisdiction. That means even I can handle this issue. So therefore, sometimes, you know, 
parties or countries can have concurrent jurisdiction to handle cases in internal waters. So next is the primary function of the law of the sea. It is basically dual in nature. You can just bifurcate it as dissemination of authority over waters and seas. That is distribution of authority of waters uh, and seas. That is internal waters, sea, territorial waters. I mean, it, it's just the authority is distributed. And then it elicits international cooperation between the states. And two is, of course, international cooperation over matters pertaining to the seas and the management of resources. So that is all. But one thing you need to remember before we close is the two important conventions. That is the 1958 convention, which was like an interim solution, and the UNCLOS convention, which actually operates based on Uh, based on the constitution of the oceans reflecting ev ev even customary laws. So basically what we are talking about is equitable and efficient use of the resources from the sea and the sea itself and the two P's that is protection and preservation of the marine environment. But again, it cannot be denied that challenges are still on even today and the law is in the, uh, still it, it is in the, mode of being developed further but now we are uh, using the unclos right and that is called the law of the sea next class we're going to go deeper into the subject now before i wind up i'd like to know uh yes ruveda sheikh do you have any question hello teacher thank you for giving me this opportunity my question isn't uh, it's not concerned the uh, lecture, but uh, I want to say that uh, this uh, this uh, one who is uh, I don't know the membership of uh, an unclear name is I mean he said to me that he has a, a problem in connection and mm -hmm. there is two other girls that told me Hamdi and Kaha they say they have uh, oh, she is from, uh, a six children. Okay. Okay, so you say that they try to enter the class, but well, uh, we get notification here and it's quite transparent and even you can see here, you see there is a, you know, a kind of a margin there you can see, um, you know, you can see who's trying to enter the class as well, but uh, they've not tried to enter the class probably so, so they'll have to check their connection. Even as you know, in the, in the beginning of the class, we had some issues. Well, well, they should try hard and you know, you there is no other option. Cannot hear you, there is a problem. Okay, so your name is Amin Mohammed. Thank you, Amin Mohammed, for giving me your name. So in that way, it's easy for me to, uh, you know, allot your, uh, I mean, to give your attendance. And again, it's Ruveda Sheikh, Abdullahi Mahmood, um, Ali, Omar said, and you. Amin Muhammad. Okay, so you will be granted attendance. Again, I'm reiterating a little bit, uh, I mean, again, a little bit about the rules of this class. Please be to the class on time. It's in your best interest. And um, five minutes buffering time. But beyond that, you know, the class is going to kick off. I mean, it will, you know, uh, the class will begin. It will not go beyond, you know, um, a particular time that if, if I say it's 7 30, it's 7 30 and 7 35 max, it's going to really start. So, buffering time I can extend to 10 minutes, but the class is going to start within that five minutes. So, you'll have to be there on time. In fact, you can be before time, but 7 30, the class is going to begin. Next is, of course, your assignments. A gentle reminder on that it has to be submitted on time. Delayed submission carries negative marking. Please do not commit the mistake of not submitting on time. And you will have to upload it in your Google Classroom. That way it is a transparent mode. And it is a kind of a record for your university, a transparent record to the university, for the university in fact rather. And it is for me as well, a transparent record. And for you as well, you know what is happening with your marks, right? So that is why I encourage everyone to please submit your assignments online to a particular portal that is provided to you, that is your Google Classroom. And please do not send any 
email to me with any attachments of your assignments because that's not going to do any good. That's, again, in your best interest. Next is if you have any questions, you're always free to ask me at the end of the class. And for now, the class is done, right? So we, I meet you again next Friday, same time. It is 7.30 p.m. your time. Okay. Okay. Bye-bye.